Hey, welcome to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. It is NCAA Tournament Week. We got a lot going on in college basketball and here to break it down for you on the South region. We've got Adam Finkelstein and myself, David Cobb. Adam, the last time I saw you, do you remember the last time I saw you? Can you walk us through that interaction? Yeah, so I was trying to defend you uh, because on a previous iteration of, of this podcast, you had slandered Danny Hurley, and um, and he remembered, and he saw us uh, together outside the tunnel in Houston last year, and one of us got invited into the locker room to celebrate, and the other one was banished, um, and we haven't we haven't seen each other since, but it w it was a fun time inside the locker room, I'll tell you that. Yeah, and I will say this, uh, you were right last season about UConn. We, we had talked prior to the season about the Huskies, and I was a little down on them. I wasn't totally sure if Jordan Hawkins had that big step forward in him, and he did. And uh, you were high on him, and you were right. So uh, we're going to get into some predictions here from the South region, which does not contain UConn. Right. Uh, and, and if you're going based off last year's track record, you want to side with Adam here. But I will say this, I will be on location in Memphis for Houston versus Longwood nice. and Nebraska versus Texas A&M, which is the Trev Alberts Bowl. But in reality, Adam, I don't know where you fall on the South region, just looking at it from a broad-based standpoint. But to me, the two most interesting teams in this region are Duke and Kentucky. Uh, what, what do you see when you look at this South region from a big picture standpoint? Yeah, I mean, hopefully this isn't a hot take, but those are, you know, probably the two preeminent brands in college basketball, not necessarily the best teams year in and year out those are that, that everybody recognizes. And they're both threats this year. So it's it's good TV and people are going to be looking into that. Houston's been one of the top three teams all year, but they're a little beat up right now. So um, I would agree with you that Kentucky and Duke are going to be the teams that people are focused on. OK, but but in terms of intriguing storylines, those are the brands. Is, is there anyone else that you spot in this bracket that kind of screams like March at you, like a, a team that you see that that could maybe capture the nation or, or intrigue the masses that maybe isn't really being talked about going into this thing? You know, to be honest with you, I think the subplot of this region is injuries. I mean, you've got a Houston team that's a little beat up, as I mentioned. Marquette, Tyler Kolek is you know, the major wild card there. If he's 100%, I would probably pick Tyler Kolek to, and Marquette to come out of this region, but we don't know if he's going to play at all. I mean, Shaka Smart says there's going to be a progression beginning on Tuesday, and hopefully he gets on the court at the end of the week, and Florida's in a similar situation. So I really think the impact of injuries and the fact that the two teams we mentioned first, Duke and Kentucky, are the ones that seem healthy, I think that's a big talking point of the South region. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, Sunday, uh, Florida starting center Micah Handlock and went down with a pretty gruesome lower leg injury in the SEC tournament championship game. Florida is relatively well equipped to withstand something like that because you know they have Tyree Samuel, they have Alex Condon uh, still available to them in the front court. If we're going with a with a sleeper pick here, and I'll ask you for yours next. Oh yeah. Mine is Florida. This is a team that has operated below the surface of the national radar for most of the year. They've not been ranked all that often. They've not been in that elite company of the SEC mentioned along the likes of Tennessee, Kentucky, Auburn, Alabama. They've sort of been a notch below those guys uh, on Jimmy Dykes's jet. They've been business class, not first class. You know what I mean? But but I look at Florida and I see all the ingredients even after the hand locked an injury because of the depth they have in the front court. And because of the guard play with Walter Clayton and Zion pull in, I, I really like Florida in this region. It's, I'm not saying it's an easy path, uh, but, but I, I just like them as a team and they would probably be my, my top sleeper in the South region. So I've got an interesting take because I'm going to pick the team that I think they will face in the first round. They have to win the play in game, but I really like Colorado. Because from a sheer talent perspective, these guys have a top three that can play with absolutely anybody. Like KJ Simpson, this guy's numbers are absurd this season. Almost 20 points, six rebounds, five assists per game. And how about these shooting splits? 48% from the floor, 45% from the three-point line. And that's not on low volume. And 87% from the free throw line. 
You add Tristan De Silva into that. He's a versatile, efficient forward. Then on top of that, you got Cody Williams, who's going to be a high lottery pick. So this team, I think, hasn't yet reached their full potential. You could make the argument that they've somewhat underachieved. But going into the uh, end of the season there, they won eight straight before falling to Oregon in that Pac-12 title game. So they were starting to hit their stride. And I just think when you get to the NCAA tournament, it becomes about, you know, sometimes it's just about, quite frankly, like who's got the dudes? <laughs> Colorado's got some dudes. Yeah, and that kind of leads me into my next question for you. But teams that might be underseeded, I, I think you could argue that Boise State and Colorado are both underseeded, being forced to go to Dayton and play in the first four. Those are two pretty talented teams with large bodies of work. I mean, I think Boise State, I think Jerry Palm had them as a seventh seed going into the selection show. He doesn't usually miss uh, much. And the fact that the committee saw them as a 10 and is making them play an extra game this week, uh, that, that stands out to me. Boise State maybe being underseeded, arguably Colorado as well. When you look at this South region, one through 16, what stands out to you as a team that, that may be underseeded? You know, I had some major issues with the bracket and with the seedings. Um, it mostly boils down to this. I don't know that the committee looked at or valued Ken Palm at all. And for those who don't know, Ken Palm is kind of the most widely subscribed to analytics site in all of college basketball, um, especially among coaches and even now into fans because it's easily accessible and um, and it's very affordable. So I don't I have major grievances, but less so in this region than I do. Like, for example, um, and we won't go down this rabbit hole, but I, I thought the East region was a travesty. Like that's that's like, you know, that that region is loaded. I think the South region, given some of these injuries and, and, and teams with some question marks, there's there's some things that are wide open. Um, and I, I think Duke is a very strong number four seed, although I do believe that is the correct seed. But I, I really don't have any major grievances on the seed line. Do you? Uh, I feel like Kentucky is a little high yeah. as, a, as a three. Uh, th th that, that number next to their name, to me, insinuates or forecasts more success than I think we should be presuming with a team that did lose at home this season to, to UNC Wilmington. A team that did take a, a relatively bad loss within the last month at LSU. Uh, so this is a Kentucky team that doesn't play a ton of defense. Uh, obviously, they are electric offensively. Some of the most talented players in the NCAA tournament this year are on that Kentucky team. Some of them are, are freshmen. Uh, that it just makes me a little nervous, I guess, more so than anything about Kentucky. And maybe the three seed is fair, but I just have my doubts about the Wildcats in a roster that is so youth oriented at this time of year. I mean, we saw them go one and done in the SEC tournament. We've seen them be so inconsistent over the course of the year. And now we're going into an event where veteran guard play seems to often be the, the recipe for success. And, you know, Rob Dillingham and Reed Shepard, as incredible as they have been, as great as they will be uh, as lottery picks, potentially in this next draft. I, I just have my reservations about the way that roster is composed, you know, going into uh, the NCAA tournament. I think they're a team that has a wide variety of possible outcomes. And we've seen that during the course of the season. You just mentioned some of their bad losses, but they have some extraordinary wins too. And I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that this is a different type of Kentucky team. Yes, it's freshman driven, and that is what we've come to expect from John Calipari over the years. But this is a team that's playing faster than he likes. This is a team that is much more reliant on the three-point shot than he likes. Uh, in fact, I would personally argue that they should be shooting more threes. They're the second best three-point shooting team in the country. Excuse me. I think they're the, the best three-point shooting team in the country. But in terms of the number of threes they take per game relative to total field goal attempts, they're about middle of the pack. Um, John Calipari talked this week about maybe adding a defensive wrinkle and playing two seven footers at the same time, uh, to which point I and everyone else who has liked to watch their offense just started screaming, no, like don't don't sacrifice the offense. If anything, double down more into that play faster, shoot more threes, because everybody's getting really focused on how many points the opposition is scoring against Kentucky and not focused enough on the per possession metrics. Like 
it's it's not like they're not a great defensive team, but they're not a terrible defensive team. They're they're 108th in defense in the country per KenPom.com. Now, again, I know that's not a resource that the committee utilizes. It's just one that educated basketball people do. Um, so it's um, their whole thing defensively is that they don't turn you over and they give up second chance points. So he talks about playing another shot blocker. You know where they rank in block shot percentage in the country? Well, well, they're third nationally in blocks per game. Yeah, and in terms of block percentage, they're number one in the country. Like, you don't need another shot blocker in there. You're already the best. You need somebody to get the defensive rebound other than the big man. That's That's been the problem, is that they're giving up offensive rebounds. Um, so I don't think they need another seven-footer unless it's for rebounding. And I think that, again, for a team that has shot the ball so well and been such a machine offensively, they could really lean into that a little bit more. Yeah, to your point, Adu Thiero, who is more of a wing, he's their second leading rebounder behind Trey Mitchell at 5.2 per game. And you're right, Kentucky does rank first nationally in three-point percentage, 41.2%, which is just obscene. And a lot of that is attributable to Reed Shepard, who's just been absolutely bonkers this season after he was, I think, the fifth highest rated player in his own class. And now we're talking about this guy as one of the top five players in the entire 2024 NBA draft class. Kentucky will provide no shortage of fodder over these next few days and, and maybe these next few weeks, because if they can get on a run, they will be the electric in the weeks ahead. Let's get to Duke. Where are you at on these guys, man? Like, I just can't get a read on them. They, they falter at home against UNC to close the regular season. They go one and done in the ACC tournament. And now we got to trust these guys uh, in the NCAA tournament. Uh, it's, that's tough for me, man. Uh, where, where are you at on the Blue Devils? Well, you know, uh, two weeks ago, we were we were on our, our 24-7 sports show saying that we expected them to beat North Carolina at home and clinch a share of the ACC regular season. They obviously didn't do that. Then they lose to NC State in the ACC tournament. So they're 0 for 2 in terms of what their goals were, the regular season and then uh, tournament championship from the ACC. But the bottom line is, is that they are still uh, probably the most talented team in this region, if not the entire country. I mean, they are absolutely loaded. Um, Kyle Filipowski is, is as skilled and versatile a big as there is in the country. Mark Mitchell has been up and down, but we don't talk enough about the defensive impact they, he provides. And I, I've said this at various points throughout the season. I think the key for Duke is getting their three guards when they're all in the lineup together to play well at the same time. Like Jared McCain came alive this season when Tyrese Proctor went out of the lineup. Jeremy Roach, he's capable of, of putting numbers on the board, and I think he's been freed up by being able to slide off the ball. But can those three guys play well on the same night? I don't know that we've seen that, certainly not consistently. So I think that's really, um, that's really the thing that if that can ever click, uh, they've got a chance to be really good. And I'll also say this. I, I like their draw um, because where they can struggle is if you get like a, a real space eating big man who flips got to try and guard on the block. And there's there's really nobody like that in this region. So I, I think this has the potential for Duke to make a run, certainly. Although Houston, even though they're a little beat up, will, will obviously probably be the favorite in the game and certainly pose a threat. Yeah, I'm mostly with you on Duke there. The talent edge should be enough against Vermont. Then again, that's probably what Syracuse thought in 2005 uh, when they were a number four seed and lost to a number 13 seed in Vermont. So just, just keep your eyes on the Catamounts there, who I believe are making their third consecutive NCAA tournament appearance out of the America East. Uh, speaking of the, of the Catamounts and, and a double-digit seed there, uh, just a, a quick couple of storylines from some of the, quote, other teams in this region. Uh, Oakland. Something really cool going on here with Greg Campy. He's the longest tenured coach in college basketball now that Jim Beheim has retired. Uh, he's got the Grizzlies in as a 14 seed. Uh, they are Kentucky's opponent, and uh, Greg Campy would captivate the nation if Oakland is able to pull an upset there. Uh, then I also wanted to, to mention real quick Longwood and their head coach, Griff Aldridge. It's ironic that Longwood is playing Houston because Griff Aldridge – uh, prior to his tenure with Longwood, he was a longtime AAU coach in uh, the city of Houston. And he really like poured his life and his soul and all of his energy into that city, into 
developing players uh, in, in that community. So to see Longwood get to play Houston is pretty interesting to me. And, and then, of course, James Madison be begins the season by winning at Michigan State when Michigan State was ranked in the top five. They've got 31 victories. So we've got some, some interesting storylines with some of these double-digit seeds here. Is there a Cinderella team, Adam, that is kind of catching your eye as maybe somebody who can make a little noise here? Well, as I said, I, I like whoever comes out of that Florida, Colorado, maybe Boise State matchup. I think that is a team that could be dangerous, especially if Tyler Kolek isn't isn't healthy. Um, you know what I think is ironic about this, though, is that the team that no one is talking about anymore is Houston. And listen, I understand they got blown out uh, by Iowa State in the, in the Big 12 tournament there. But this is a team that has been among the top three consensus teams in college basketball essentially all year long and was a top Ken Palm for more time this season than any other team in college basketball. They've got a dynamic backcourt in LJ Cryer and Jamal Shedd. Um, they have the second best defense in the country. What I worry about with them, though, is the fact that they play really, really slow. And so when you talk about winning four games in a row or six games in a row, it gives you a, a, a slim margin of error just because of the sheer limited number of possessions you have in a game. So it makes you a little bit more susceptible to running into a team that could get hot and start making shots, uh, which is similar to what happened uh, against Iowa State. But again, Houston's number one seed for a reason. And I think it's natural. Everybody's going to talk about Duke and Kentucky, but um, I'm not sure we're talking enough about Houston and Marquette. Okay, so you heard it here first, Longwood over Houston. That is uh, Adam Finkelstein's uh, <laughs> prediction. Um, no, and, and all seriousness, actually, if you were ranking the number 16 over number one potential upsets in terms of like practicality, I think I think this Houston would be the most vulnerable because of what you mentioned, the fact that they go slow. But you got to go back to like 2018 to find an example of Houston losing against a team of this type of caliber. I mean, Longwood started out two and eight in, in league play before closing strong uh, to reach the NCAA tournament. Again, you just, you, you never know in these situations. Okay. So uh, I think we're getting down to the point where we need to start making some predictions here. All right. uh, you know, you, you talk Houston and Marquette, you maybe tipped your hand a little bit there, but again, when you got Kentucky and Duke uh, sitting there with all the talent that they have on their rosters, you know, uh, it's not an easy pick uh, from this South region. Uh, where where are you leaning uh, in terms of who you think is going to emerge from this thing and and, and make it to uh, the Final Four? Yeah, I, I've got Duke going to going to Phoenix from this bracket, and but that is kind of contingent upon um, Tyler Kolek not being fully healthy. I, I think that um, as I said about about Houston, when you start talking about um, teams that can string together four really good games in a row. I just worry about Kentucky. They have such a wide range of potential outcomes. Um, I, I think I think Duke is probably the team I would go with, but I think legitimately any of those first four seeds could make um, runs, in it, and it wouldn't be very surprising. Yeah, I, I filled out a bleary-eyed bracket after article number seven, you know, late Sunday night following this election show. And I went with Marquette and I think I'm sticking with that for now. I, I do believe that Tyler Kolek is going to come back and, and be available. Shaka Smart certainly intimated as much on Inside College Basketball and CBS Sports Network on Sunday. It's a situation where you're starting to see load management become part of the calculus in conference tournament week for some of these top teams. Look at what Kansas did by sitting Kevin McCuller and Hunter Dickinson in the Big 12 tournament. Had those guys really needed to play, I think they could have played. If Marquette had absolutely needed Tyler Kolek to play in the Big East tournament, I think he probably could have played. They chose to rest him for the sake of him being ready for the big dance. This is a Marquette team that won a Big East tournament last yeah, year. That's what I was just going to ask you. Yeah, so is that your calculus then? You're saying, hey, you know what? We already got this one. What we don't have is the NCAA tournament run. We're going to make sure Tyler's good for that. Are you, that what you're thinking Shaka Smart and Marquette did last week? That's exactly it. It's been a long time since Marquette has made an NCAA tournament run. They got bounced in the second round last season after an otherwise spectacular year for the program. I think what Shaka Smart is doing is smart. He is prioritizing the NCAA tournament, knowing that he's got that recent conference, you know, banner hanging in the gym, right? So 
you don't got to go and get that. You don't have to spend all of your energy and all of your resources in chase of a conference title when right. the, the big dance is looming and uh, your program and your fan base is thirsty for success in, in, in the real tournament. And so I, I'm siding with Marquette here. Uh, this is a team that brought so much back from last year. And those guys remember that feeling of disappointment losing in the second round. And I mean, you just look at the fact they made the Big East tournament title game, even without Tyler Kolek. And so to me, I think there's some, some confidence to be drawn from that. And now you get them back if he's close to hundred percent. I'm going golden Eagles with this thing. Well, and can I, I just add to that, like Cam Jones without Tyler Kolek in the lineup, we, we saw, um, and it's not just without him. Like we've seen this in recent weeks, but Cam Jones has really elevated his game and is uh, just for NBA purposes. We're, we're seeing a new level of prospect in terms of his impact on the college game. We're seeing a new level of production. And so you kind of look at it and you say, hey, if he can sustain that level and then you can get Tyler back, that backcourt is now as dynamic as any they're going to run into here. And, and so I agree with you. I'm just using the caveat of, Hey, Tyler's got to be healthy. Like if we're if we're believing that he was capable of playing last week, um, but you know they were they were trying to get him to the point where where he'd be at his best for the NCAA tournament, then I'm I'm all in on that because um, I, I do think that if Tyler Kolek is healthy with what we've seen from Cam Jones and from Oso, um, you know they they have as good a chance of it as anyone. Hey, real quick, let's, let's get out of here on this. Uh, what is your favorite or most interesting first round game in this, in this South region. Uh, I mean, what, which one, which from an individual game standpoint, which one are you most interested in? So I, I know we already talked about this one, but I, I think it's a seven to 10 game, Florida versus that Boise state, Colorado uh, winner. Again, Colorado loaded with talent, Boise state, probably under seated Florida uh, capable of making a run, but battling some injuries. So um, that is certainly one that I have circled as, as one of the more intriguing games um, in, in my bracket. How about you? What's the what's what's one in this region that you think is particularly intriguing? Yeah, I'm torn between two that we didn't really get a chance to talk about much, which is why I wanted to bring it up. Uh, the, the Trev Alberts Bowl, uh, Nebraska and Texas A&M, uh, which I'll be there for in Memphis, is interesting to me. Kese Tomanaga is a potential electric factory, a uh, little guard from Nebraska, who's just got a, an ability to go off and, and, and put a team on his back with some of the creative shot making that he can pull out of the bag. Nebraska, I think, is the last power conference team to never win an NCAA tournament game. To see them get that done would be fascinating. But I think Texas a and playing really well right now and has really great veteran guard play. And then Texas Tech, NC State, for this reason, DJ Burns, my man. If you didn't get to see the ACC tournament, uh, he is a hoss. And uh, he helped guide the Wolfpack on a really incredible run there. So uh, I, I'm excited to see NC State back in action against Texas Tech uh, because that one was, um, yeah, that, that, that could be a really interesting game. It could be a chance for the ACC to kind of claim some pride away from the Big 12 after a lot of these ACC and Big East coaches uh, felt like the, the Big 12 sort of rigged the system this year. That's a conversation for, for a whole nother day, though. Um, so before we get out of here on the South region, any any parting thoughts or or, or last uh, remarks on on where things stand with this uh, this region going into things? I, I would leave you with this is I, I think this region is as wide open as anyone where you have four teams in Houston, Marquette, Kentucky and Duke who could all feel really good about their chances of making a run to Phoenix. There you have it. That's the South region of the 2024 NCAA tournament. Appreciate you guys hanging with us here on the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. See you again soon.